Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lena Maya Hein, and I welcome you to the session Biomolecular Structures. Our first speaker is John Jumper. He's actually a trained physicist. Um, he joined DeepMind in 2018 and is currently the lead for protein modeling. Today, he will talk about computational predictions of protein structures associated with COVID-19. So John, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, really excited to be here and talk about the work we've been doing. Oh my, uh, I apologize if I've got some kids in the background. And can you all see that? So this is uh, representing joint work uh, by a team at DeepMind that has been working on protein structure prediction for a long time and then trying to find a good way to contribute to uh, work against COVID-19. And so especially want to call out uh, Catherine and Pushmeet and Demis have uh, really been heavily involved in making sure that we can, uh, ah, someone can only see half the slide. Um, okay, great, great. So this is, uh, let's see, where was, I? oh yeah. This is, uh, so we're ongoing work we've been doing in structure prediction for a while now, and then, and trying to find the right application uh, related to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. So I'll talk with, I'll start with a bit of a non-technical introduction to the protein folding problem, what we're trying to understand, maybe what we can't understand with these types of methods. We'll talk about some of the predictions that we've made on, so on well, we talked about what are the important proteins in SARS-CoV-2 and our predictions on them and we'll talk about conclusions, future work either by us or places where we think really uh, the community can get involved strongly. And so the proteins themselves are important machines, normally I would say in the cell, but in this case also in the virus, that the, gene the genetics of an organism uh, codes for a large number of proteins that perform an enormous number of processes essential to life. And what's really, really remarkable about these machines is that they are produced in a long rope, a single one-dimensional strand or a sequence of letters, and then will spontaneously, especially in the small cases, into active 3D structures. And one of the grand challenges in biology is to predict from something that is very, very readily obtainable, um, the genetic sequence in which we have many, many genetic sequences of, uh, of many, many organisms and of SARS-CoV-2 almost immediately, how can we predict the important protein structures and then use this information to reason about function, misfunction, mutation, et cetera. And so the kind of machine learning is a sequence to sequence problem you can imagine where you have a sequence over a 20 letter alphabet on the left and you have a set of 3D coordinates and we're actually predicting a static shape kind of rather than the dynamical process we're showing. And the challenge of doing this experimentally is the time scales of experimental structure determination are normally in the months to years. There were a few SARS-CoV-2 structures that have come out related to the spike, related to the main protease that came out very, very quickly. But often that's because the proteins that they're characterizing there are extremely similar to proteins that have been crystallized before. And so they're able to reuse a lot of the knowledge on that. And in DeepMind, we focused on what's called the free modeling or de novo structure prediction problem, where we're really trying to understand and predict the structure of proteins for which no similar protein has been crystallized. And what can we do in cases where there's really very, very little information to go off of or copy from, et cetera. And when you think about SARS-CoV-2, you've got, uh, there are a few different counts, but 27, 29 proteins in SARS-CoV-2, and only a very small number of them are actually part of the virus particles themselves. So you'll see the famous spike protein uh, is there, the E protein and the M protein are also proteins that are structural that are in the outer, uh, in the membrane of the virus in this case. And inside the virus is the RNA genome that codes for a lot more proteins that are what are called non-structural proteins. So these are proteins that are only really expressed when the cell is infected that use the uh, host machinery to get produced. And then those are used to for the virus to replicate itself and to make new viral particles and those particles go on 
to continue the infection. And so in many cases, those proteins are relatively understudied, not all of them, but there are about, say, 10 proteins that really have no known structure. They're often thought to be structured, um, and we really don't understand a lot about them. And we hope to find ways that we could contribute by making structure predictions about these proteins. And when we want these structures, we want them for a couple of purposes. And we should say, like, the best purpose, the one you would really, really hope is that if you had the structure of the protein, maybe you could recognize a drug that's already uh, proven safe in humans that could be used for this. It hasn't happened on these proteins yet. It's a very hard thing to do. But even beyond that, there's quite a lot of work to understand the biology of this virus, to understand how it interacts with the host proteins and kind of get functional hypotheses about places we can intervene. And here, when you're talking about planning experiments or trying to find the meaningful subunits of these proteins that could have individual functions, the individual domains, here really having a first look at the structure can do a lot to help with that planning and understanding of the interactions and possibly provide context for all the great genetics work that's been going on. So this was a recent paper out of, I believe, Arizona State University, where they uh, looked at a new mutation in ORF7 and that there was a large deleted section of this protein you can see in the top sequence. And they don't know what implications that might have. Or similarly, if you compare uh, to BAT or the original SARS sequence, you can see some variations. And we'd like to understand what those variations might mean. And we can do a lot from a genetics point of view, but we can also give these a structural physical context. Are these surface mutations? Are they deeply buried? Is it on the part that binds one of the host proteins and maybe affects the uh, binding strength? And so we hope that by contributing some structural knowledge, we can start to understand these mutations, put them in context, and contribute to the overall understanding of the virus and the infection process. We should say that this is not just DeepMind that's been working on this problem. So CASP is the critical assessment of, stru of structure prediction, is um, a forum for people to compare their structure prediction methods in a blind competition, and also runs CASP Commons, which uh, folds proteins of interest to the community outside the competition setting. And so for a set of these 10 very hard uh, SARS-CoV-2 targets, 1,600 models were submitted by 52 groups. And you can see some of the structure and metal analysis starting to emerge, and we've contributed our predictions to that effort as well. And so when you think about protein structure prediction, and this is a field that has developed over many decades, but the very, very high level block diagram is you start from a protein sequence that is obtainable from genetics, and then the very first step is to find all these uh, related proteins in a protein database to uh, find a picture of the genetics and the genetic history of this protein. And that turns out to have, has been shown by many people to have a very, very strong relationship to the 3D structure that you can predict that thing that uh, even if the positions in a protein sequence are distant, if they strongly evolve together, then that needs some explanation. That explanation is often physical proximity in the folded structure. And so, but it is a very complex and nonlinear function to learn. And so you take the protein sequence, you grab a large collection of related sequences, you go through a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms that I'm not going to go into in this talk. And at the end, you've got a prediction of the 3D structure. And you can see a description of the system that we used previously. We used a uh, improved version for these predictions but we have a recent paper on this. And so when you apply this system to SARS-CoV-2, we found six of the 10 targets we really had a confident prediction on. Some of the other four were quite small and may not be structured, or simply we didn't, we wanted to add to the conversation enough, not too much noise about it. So when we were not confident, we erred toward holding back. And so you can start to get a picture of these proteins and you can see the membrane protein, which is structural, but then a lot of the other non-structural proteins, some of which have unknown function, some of which have known function uh, in, in the uh, viral life cycle. And so we are understanding, we've released these uh, freely. You can see a link at the bottom uh, on where to download these structures, but we're hoping that this gives insights and planning into people on how they do experiments on these targets. 
Um, one example of this is the M protein. Now I should say that this is believed to be, if I recall correctly, a tetramer or dimer of dimers in, uh, in there. So we've only modeled one of the units, but you will see three distinct helices that are the transmembrane domain expected to be uh, three pass transmembrane uh, segments. And then the, I believe, intracellular domain. And so this already is something that you can use to provide structural context to ask where these mutations lie relative to these different domains. We do also, and I would say it's very important in these because these are hard uh, protein folding targets, uh, that we provide measures of confidence on regions that where you should trust us and regions where you should really not trust us. And uh, we also interestingly confirm a hypothesized similarity to ORF3A, that our predictions for the ORF3A protein and the M protein are very similarly structurally, and that was thought to be the case. Now, in terms of what we think we've done is we, we think that we've made some contribution to understanding the virus and its mutations, and we make uh, these freely available, and we hope people will build on them, hope they will build on them in terms of analyzing and understanding the disease, and we hope that they'll build on them in terms of modeling. So some of the questions that are not answered here is what about all the interactions with the host proteins? In many cases, those experimental methods are starting to show which host proteins are interacted with, at least in a relatively high throughput manner, but we don't know the structure, we don't know the context or the function of those interactions. And so we hope that structural models will uh, contribute to this. I should say on a cautionary note that uh, it will be a very bad sign if drug development really has to proceed against these targets. These are internal targets, they're not very good from an antibody point of view. That's one of the reasons the antibody is focused on the spike is it's available and accessible rather than being inside the host cell. And uh, there are drugs against the protease, but to develop a drug against a new target like one of these would take years. And so we really hope that current therapy efforts uh, will succeed, but obviously that's something that we're thinking about. And um, we really hope that they will contribute to our understanding that there's a tremendous amount of structural biology work that still needs to be done against these proteins. We still need to understand how to intervene. And even when we understand a decent amount about the function, rational intervention is very hard. I think there are lots of really interesting discussions about pain medications and their effect on ACE2 and their effect on the virus. And all of this is challenging both biologically and structurally. And so that's what I have. <laughs>